bless God's precious and holy name on this Palm Sunday. Now, I am, I am looking right there at my wife. I see her with my own eyes, but at the same time, I can hear her in my ear. You want to know, know what she's saying to me? Come here, come close, come close. Let me tell you what she's saying. She's saying, Jay, it's first Sunday. You can't preach the whole Bible. She, she's telling me that you're about to have Holy Communion, so you got to get people in and out. You've already married a couple, so you don't have to be long to be strong. So as we prepare for a sermonette, let's take a moment and go before God in prayer. Precious and wonderful God, we thank you for the sacrifice that your darling son Jesus made on his way into Jerusalem more than 2,000 years ago. We pray now, dear God, that you will allow our hearts and our minds to be open to the wonders that are you. Hide me now, God, behind the old rugged cross and allow my brothers and sisters here assembled to see absolutely none of me, but dear God, to only see thee. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. And let the church say, amen. Join me in the gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter, the first through the 11th verses. It is printed in your bulletins, and I believe it will be up on the screens. But the gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter, the first through the 11th verses, and I will be reading now from the New Revised Standard Version of the Holy Bible. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go! into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and sat on them. A very large crowd. Somebody say crowd. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he reached Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? Again, he tells us, the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. My brothers and sisters, for just a few moments that is mine this morning, I want to talk with you from the topic, to walk with Jesus. To walk with Jesus. Years ago, after I was ordained into ministry, I received my very first pastoral appointment to serve a church in a place in Tangible Hoa, Paris, Louisiana. I dare you to try to spell it. And I remember an older minister who was retiring just as I was being ordained, took the time to teach me a lesson as a new seminary graduate. It is a lesson that was so profound back then, it continues to remain with me to this day, and it really stuck out in my heart and in my mind over the course of the last two weeks. Now, this retiring minister spoke, had a hearing impediment, so it made him, when he spoke, he, he spoke sort of loudly, like he almost had to scream when he talked. He said to me, Augustine! I said, yes, sir. He said, Augustine, everybody knows you got something in your head, but the people want to know if you got something in your heart. I said, yes, sir. I thought he was going down the line to talk to the next old man, but he came back and he said to me, Augustine, people don't care how much you know. 
do people want to know how much you care? He told me that pastoring God's people was going to teach me how to pray. And pastoring God's people was also going to teach me how to walk with Jesus. Now, I don't know if that retiring minister had any formalized education, but I do know that minister had some of the best common sense I have ever heard. To put that minister's wise counsel into seminary terms, he was saying that the virtue of empathy is the lens through which the Christian must interact with others. Meaning, in addition to all the burdens we bear, all the things we have to deal with in life, empathy compels us to identify with others such that their pain is our pain, and that shared pain will teach us to pray and make us walk with Jesus. Now, in walking with Jesus, I take that as to be a source of spiritual renewal. When you're forced to deal with some of the inevitable chaos that goes along, with living through this thing called life. Let me give you a couple examples of what I mean. In beginning this Holy Week, I am reminded that gun violence 55 years ago this Tuesday was the cause of death of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel down in Memphis, Tennessee. That means all of us ought to take some time this week to walk with Jesus. I guess we all ought to really walk with Jesus because when we think about the fact that gun violence killed Dr. King in Memphis, Tennessee, it's also gun violence that was the cause of death of a whole bunch of young people at Covenant Presbyterian School in Nashville, Tennessee, only 10 months after the horrific shooting at Robb Elementary School down in Uvalde, Texas. I got to personally walk with Jesus because I'm supposed to be the national chaplain of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. That means I recognize the value that black Greek letter organizations have made and continue to make in black America. But it breaks my heart. Sister, you said you're from Florida. It breaks my heart down with the foolishness going on in Florida. As Florida's governor is launching a presidential bid, his politics of anti-diversity are threatening to eliminate Greeks on college campuses while also threatening to eliminate the discussion of black history, even at HBCUs. And in case you missed the big news on Thursday, well, all of us ought to shake our heads and all of us ought to try to walk with Jesus because with the stroke of a tweet, a twice impeached and now criminally indicted former president of the United States of America has been able to raise millions of dollars in a campaign bid because some people want the architect of of January 6th back in the White House. But watch this. You don't need to look at national headlines to walk with Jesus. If you came to church today, I hope you came to church to walk with Jesus. I hope you came not because you you want to play patty cake, patty cake baker, man. I hope you came to church because you're not afraid to deal with real issues in life, real issues, and you're asking Jesus to fix your situation. Uh, If you have a loved one that's been in the hospital or a loved one that's been back and forth to the doctor's office and you're trying to pray your way through the situation, You came to walk with Jesus. Uh, If your stack of bills keeps piling up, but your stack of money uh, keeps going down in the midst of your situation as you're asking God for just a little bit of relief, you too came hmm, to walk with Jesus. Uh, And if tomorrow morning, once again, you're going to go into the office and you're going to have to hold yourself as your blood pressure gets high and you say, man, I didn't quit better jobs than this in the past, that means you too came out today because you want to walk with Jesus. Uh, What I'm trying to say today is as we begin this holy week, this time of deep introspective reflection, it's a time for all of us to do a little spring cleaning, a time for all of us to get rid of some of the excess baggage that's in our emotional closets. Maybe that means coming through fasting. I sure hope it means coming through praying, but I'm convinced that it means all of us will have to be deliberate this week in taking the time to walk with Jesus. When we look at the text, as we begin this Passion Week and mark Jesus' journey into Jerusalem, the writer of Matthew is telling us that although it's customary for our Jewish brothers and sisters to make a pilgrimage each year to Jerusalem, this particular pilgrimage is much different than any pilgrimage before. 
Matthew tells us that this pilgrimage began as Jesus entered the village of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Simon Peter looked at him and said, well, some say it's Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say it's Jeremiah. Jesus asked him, Peter, but who do you say the Son of Man is? He said, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. And apparently Peter was not the only one who believed Jesus was the Messiah because people started to swell up around Jesus and crowds started to form as he was on his way to Jerusalem. In other words, people wanted to walk with Jesus. As they continued on the same journey, after Father begged Jesus, please stop and heal my son, Jesus healed a boy with epilepsy. Matthew then shares that the crowds had put so many demands on Jesus that Jesus needed just a minute to get away with some good friends. So Jesus went up to the Mount of Transconfiguration along with Peter, James, and John. In fact, old preachers still tell young preachers the demands of the job are far too much for you to do it alone. You need to get your time away, and whatever you do, have somebody you can trust, meaning you need a Peter, a James, and a John. Now, all of these crowds were following Jesus as he's entered this last leg of the journey, and he started to scream, Son of David! Son of David! Meaning, those crowds that were following Jesus believed that the prophecy, that the one from the line of David will save the Jewish people from their oppression under the Roman Empire, that prophecy has now come to fruition with Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It's against this backdrop that I believe Matthew is inviting us to look at this text from multiple perspectives. I believe we could look at this text from Jesus' perspective, but I believe we could also look at this text from the crowd's perspective. If we looked at this text only from Jesus' perspective, this really, really would be a short sermon. In verse 5, Jesus calls on his disciples to bring him a donkey and a colt to fulfill a prophecy that was made by the prophet Zechariah, who foretold of his entry into Jerusalem more than 550 years before. That means there really are only two other things for Jesus to do to fulfill his earthly ministry. On Friday, he's got to go to Calvary to pray the price for all of our sins. And as every preacher knows, he got to get up <clears throat> early on oh, next Sunday morning. But in looking at this text, instead of from the perspective of Jesus and looking at it from the perspective of the people, from the perspective of those large crowds, watch this. Just as in these 11 verses of Scripture, Matthew only mentions Jesus' name three times, in these same 11 verses of Scripture, Matthew describes the crowds three times, going on to tell us that the entire city of Jerusalem was in turmoil when Jesus arrived. Now, as I think back about that wise, sage advice from that retiring preacher, he told me that people will teach you how to pray. I once heard a sermon where the preacher said that prayer is the one thing. Somebody say one thing. Prayer is the one thing you can do to show that you believe in the power of God. He said that prayer is unlike going to Bible study or going to Sunday school because some people might be going at that time because they have nothing else pressing on their schedules. He said prayer is a little different from going to church because some people go to church because they're nosy. They want to see who else is in church. Some people go to church just because they want attention. They go to church because they want to be seen. He said, but prayer is the one thing that shows you believe in the power of God because it's the one thing you can do that shows God you are serious about changing your situation and you're trying to better yourself in order to walk with Jesus. Maybe Matthew is inviting us to use that lens of empathy and to look at the crowd of people in this text and to take time and pray for somebody else. Oh, you ought to pray for somebody else because if you live long enough, you sure enough going to need somebody to pray for you. 
pray uh, because the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive them of their sins, and heal their wicked land. Uh, can I tell you about some things in a wicked land? Oh, we can all learn a little something from these crowds in this text because in our own unique ways here in 2023, each of us ought to be screaming out, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. Pray. Uh, because the U.S. Supreme Court seems hell-bent on rolling back people's rights instead of protecting people's rights. Pray, because they're making it feel like instead of 2023, we're back in 1953. Pray, because whatever success those anti-diversity people have in Florida is going to be a roadmap for the anti-diversity people right here in North Carolina. Pray, because our General Assembly has proven that they don't care about voting rights and they put the rights of guns ahead of the safety of people. And with affirmative action on the chopping block, Sister Dez, they're getting ready to roll back admissions at UNC Chapel Hill more than 50 years ago. Pray, because it's Palm Sunday and a loving couple just got married. Uh, that means God has blessed them and given them a second chance. Pray, because they didn't come to take up your Palm Sunday worship. They came because Jesus said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. Pray, uh, because if you drop your children off in Nashville, you drop your children off somewhere. And if you're blessed to be old enough, maybe somebody dropped your children's children off. And we all need prayer because we all need Jesus. Pray, because Matthew is inviting us to use that sense of empathy that the retiring minister was telling me about all those years ago. Because we've got to be deliberate in bettering ourselves, deliberate in drawing closer to God, and deliberate in our part to walk with Jesus. But maybe, maybe some of the folks that came out this morning, they're not interested in playing patty cake, patty cake bakers, man. You're saying, man, I don't have no time to pray for somebody else. You know what I'm dealing with in my life right now. I need you to pray for me. I'm going to pray for myself. Pray because you got to believe that God will not only hear you, but God will come and answer your prayers. Pray because the words of the songwriter are true. There's power in the name of Jesus. Pray, uh, because it's Holy Week, and all of us ought to be deliberate to spend more time in prayer and drawing closer to God. Pray, because we need Jesus now more than ever before. What I'm really trying to say is that we can all learn so much from this text by looking at it from the perspective of the crowds. Each of us, in our own unique way, is saying, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. That means each of us ought to take time over the course of this week to walk with Jesus.